Hi everybody, uh, I'm Adrian Barnes, um, I'm coming from Israel now. Um, I've been in many countries and uh, basically my background is fish farming. I've been a fish farmer since I finished my uh, MSc uh, work in the 70s. Uh, majority of aquaponic systems that are documented were based on vegetable production with the fish supplying the nutrients. So uh, my viewpoint was a little bit different, a little bit different, but I had some uh, particular aims in what I was going to do. And this is developed onwards from that stage. I'm now doing a, a doctoral, I went back to university, went back to school, and I'm trying to research aquaponics um, and on the points that I feel, having done a two and a half year um, pilot, need to be researched in order for aquaponics to move forward. And uh, I've heard you, you, you all speak this morning, and I'm encouraged by the enthusiasm of this group and the desire to see things move forward. And I am going to return on quite a few points that were already raised, but I'm going to go through where I see aquaponics fitting in in the world. Yes, we're going to have a population of 9.6 billion in 2050, maybe. We have to see how it goes for the next 35 years. Um, but the predictions say that that's where we're at. That means that we, rec we need to increase the food supply <coughs> of uh, the world population by about 70%. It doesn't need, we, we need to do that, but the predictions are that that is what is required. You can see that the population increases about a 30% increase, and the food increase uh, projected is 70%. So there's a difference there. And the difference really is that what, 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 what is being assumed in making that statistic is that the, pro, the change of the diet of the majority of the population of the world, which is not where we are, is going to go from a carbohydrate to a higher protein diet. And that would, that, that's what gives it more of an increase. And there's a whole area that one has to look at as to what is the meaning of a high protein diet. And we'll get to that tomorrow in the nutrition, but basically fish as a source of protein is a lot more efficient than any other ter terrestrial animal that is widely eaten. Um, we, have a, we have another problem um, that we're dealing with in this process over the next 35 years, and that is that um, we're running out of fresh water. It, it's difficult for us to perceive that, especially when I'm traveling through on the train in Slovenia and I'm seeing all these rivers and how much water there is running around, it's difficult to relate to that, but it's very easy when we get home and look around in the desert and understand that that is the direction of things. Uh, about 12 million hectares a year in our present situation is becoming desert, de de desertified. Um, for all sorts of reasons, and we need to start thinking about producing food in areas that are not fertile, because if we're going to produce enough carbohydrates to feed the population at that time, we're going to have to free up fertile land to do that, and fertile land is getting less and less. Somebody mentioned today the question of energy, and I don't want to go through the full um, performance on it. Uh, I believe that we are living on the capital of about a billion years, and 
we've burnt it up in the last 30. We don't really know because we don't really know because the information is not really clear how much energy in terms of fossil fuel is left. But I would imagine that we're, we're at the end of the line pretty soon. Um, the very fact that we're seeing use of tar, uh, the tar sands in Alberta and fracking is indication that the energy industry is now grabbing at straws. But that's my personal opinion. As somebody mentioned today, we're running low on nutrients. It was very easy in the old days to go out to the Bird Islands in the Pacific and load the ships with the guano and bring the phosphates back, but the phosphates are now disappearing. We think we have enough for nitrogen, and we're not really sure. Um, we have land desertification, I've said, there's climate change, there's urbanization. We're getting to a situation where pollution and industrial waste is tangible. It's affecting our, it's affecting our well-being. It's affecting the health and the stability of families. And we have a problem in looking at all of this in its interactive uh, form. And the interactive form is basically that every one of these aspects affects the other. When we desalinize water, seawater, in order to increase the fresh water, and there are people that now say, we can produce a cubic meter of water from desalinized water, as low as whatever it is, at the moment it's about 50 cents. We're using fossil fuels to produce that 50 cents of fresh water. So everything is interlinked. And if you look at this, uh, this diagram, you can see that if we take a nexus of four aspects, which is climate, water, energy, and food fiber, they all interrelate. So you can't move forward on one without moving forward on the other. And what I would stress is that when you look at your aquaponics, you bear in mind that big picture as you do your work. What happened to humanity is that it took us about 10,000 years to get from a hunter-gatherer situation to a farming situation. We started 10,000 years in the Fertile Crescent, not far from the area that I work now, domesticating animals and moving in a, in a direction of a farming uh, survival. I, went to, I left to university in the 70s and aquaculture was about 2% of the fish production. And today it's more than 50%. It's more than 50% for two reasons. Because um, we've reached the limit on the hunting gathering of fish in the sea. We're desperately trying to get some controls so that we don't overfish and destroy the, the oceans. And that's questionable. But we started fish farming, and that process in terrestrial animals that took 10,000 years happened in the last 35. So it's all moving very, very fast. In terms of timing, the significant developments in aquaculture began in the 1970s. Actually, aquaponics, there was a lot of work at that time in various parts of uh, the United States. There was a group called the New Alchemy, Alchemy Institute. Um, uh, Dr. McMurphy continued into aquaponics. It was the precursor to the uh, University of Virgin Islands group. And their basic viewpoint was 
holistic. They wanted to see how we put it all together, and they understood that we can't just deal with one aspect without looking at the other aspects. And what we're actually dealing with in aquaponics here is that we're trying to put together two aspects. See, our training until now, and the training that we see going through the system to this day is singular, it's separative. We're going to be fish farmers, or we're going to be uh, horticulturists, or we're going to be IT um, experts, and actually what we have to be is one of two things. We either have to work together and find a way of making those things work in unison, or we have to get more knowledge. And we have to do both. So I'm now on a course of learning about plants. I have uh, the um, privilege of having a wife that knows about plants. She's <laughs> got a garden, so it helps. But we have to learn these things now. And really our limiting factor in aquaponics is how do we learn the balance between the two. And I'll talk a little bit more about that tomorrow. Um, I was invited here to talk about fish, so I'm going to talk mainly about fish. I've given you what I see as the big picture, um, and I will go straight into fish farming. Over the last 35 years, during that period where aquaculture became a major supply of fish to, to people, to, to human inputs. Traditionally, everything started in ponds. Fish farming in ponds was existent in China, in Hawaii, in, in various parts of the world there was a traditional fish farming. Fish were stocked or caught in the sea as small fry and grown in ponds, but that's where it traditionally started. And it moved forward into various more <coughs> intensive culture systems. Cages in the sea, in, in lakes, raceways, and recycled aquaculture systems that are very intensive. If we look at the, uh, the, um, the progress Okay, so we started, we started with a traditional, um, this is a logarithmic scale, and it indicates the, the, yields, the yields in kilograms per hectare. Um, so in the traditional initial fish farming systems where um, people would catch fry or grow, breed goldfish or Prussian carp is where it started and put them into ponds. They used to get somewhere in the region of 10 to 15 kilograms per, per hectare. Um, what happened was that it, it went through a process increasing in yields. The, the, these first three, this increases simply differences in temperature. Um, then there was an understanding that if um, fertilization was put in, then um, the densities increased. There was natural stocking, which was natural breeding within these ponds, but then an understanding that if we went and caught fry from another place and put them in there and increased the stocking density and so on. But basically, until um, the 1950s, 60s, there was only um, and a knowledge increasing the yields by fertilization. And fertilization meant taking chicken manure, cow manure, uh, human manure, and um, putting them in the ponds, and the trophic process increased the yields. Um, thereafter, it increased even further using the same systems. Pens were put in, in, into the ponds, cages, and the fertilization was increased. 
The big change, the intensive change, started in the 70s, 80s, when research was done on feeding, on getting a diet that gave the fish a full meal, their best nutritional. And, you know, if I look at the nutritional work that go with many days of lectures on nutrition, that the exact requirements of the exact type of species have been researched by the females because it's a very big business. And today, the efficiency is enormous. So the big step forward was um, when feeding was added to the fertilization. And densities went up and yields went up to thousands of kilograms per hectare. The minute feed was put into the ponds, um, <coughs> problems began. And problems began because when you add feed to a pond, it breaks down and it pollutes the water in simple terms. And it re re the, this pollution pro process, which is not really pollution, it's a natural process, is that the bacteria then have a source of growing media and they start growing and they use the oxygen. So the first thing that happened was there were problems with aeration in ponds. There wasn't enough air and that was the limiting factor. And immediately after that, <coughs> immediately after that in the uh, 80s, 90s, in traditional aquaculture, all the systems of aeration came in and improved. And as they improved, the yields went up another step. And then there were pro other problems. The problems were nutrient levels that were limiting to, to growth. And the nutrient levels that were limiting to growth were ammonia, basically ammonia, and others that developed sulfides from the soil, various other high density production issues that had to be dealt with. And the way that was dealt with was by trying to look for other systems of production in cages or in raceways where the water could be put through the system very fast, the fish were densified, and the water that left took away the pollutants. That's a fine system, except that if we're looking at the big picture, you're putting out a high level of nutrients into natural waters, and you're getting eutrophication, and you have issues with how, how you deal with that situation. So, having said all of that um, in relation to the fish, where did aquaponics come into the picture? Aquaponics, and, and this is probably you know, like I'm talking to the preacher, preached. What aquaponics is actually doing is it's modeling a natural system where we are trying to control not only the inputs and the outputs that are related to economic issues, but also trying to relate to the outputs that are related to what we used to call waste. And waste is no longer waste. If anything has changed, we are now in the world where we have to look at waste as not being waste. It has to be a material for being recycled. And we cannot say that there's a byproduct of an industrial process or an agricultural process. We have to say, we're going to close the loop and we're going to put this back. That's the basis to um, the future and that's the basis to aquaponics. We'll talk uh, in time about why I think uh, Pierre was asking how many aquaponic systems in the world are commercially viable. I don't know any yet. 
I really am uh, in touch with a lot of people that are involved in aquaponics and I don't know any aquaponic uh, system that is commercially viable at this moment. And that is the question that we have to ask and that I asked and we'll talk about it. But in principle, what we're dealing with, if we break it down, we have fish, we have bacteria, and we have vegetables. And we're trying to see how we get the interaction between them. Now, as is always the situation, aquaponics and uh, Vesna has already gone over this today. Uh, aquaponics was being done a long time ago. It was it renewed in the in the uh, in the uh, Myanmar Tia Lake. Basically, what we have in a, a, a primal aqua, what I call a primal aquaponic system is we have a lake or a water body or a pond. It doesn't matter. Something of a particular size that is either re is receiving some form of organic matter, and that matter is called causing eutrophication in that lake. And what we're saying is eutrophication is basically photosynthesis, sun turning carbon into body matter and energy, and removing the nutrients from the water. And what we're going to do is we're going to either stock fish or have fish growing in there and breeding themselves and we're going to, go pl we're going to grow plants to remove the nutrients. And that, those were the, the, the various pictures that they've already seen. The, these were the, the Aztecs when they did it. Um, these are the, uh, the floating gardens. This is a, uh, a project in China where they had a very highly eutrophied lake and started growing crops on it and made basically re reversed the system back to a reasonable water quality. We, 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 are, we are looking also at a possibility of a second system and I'm giving you a, a as I was asked, a, a feel of what are the possibilities here in aquaponic systems. The Cascade system is basically using water initially in fish fry and grow out tanks, passing it on to potentially aquaponic canals, and then using that water to irrigate a field afterwards and using the waste from the fish to also fertilize those fields. So that is another model. That model has actually been done for a long time. It's been done in Israel for many, many years. You're looking here at a, uh, a, a fish cotton farm in uh, the Galilee. The, um, the river base that you see here is active probably 10 hours in the year. The water is pumped into the... Uh, we, we, in a, in a major uh, rainfall, if it happens, it's pumped into the reservoir. The reservoir has, uh, you can see at the edges here, feeders. Fish are fed, they grow, and at the end of the summer, the, the, the reservoir is about 15, 20 meters high. The water is slowly taken down and used to irrigate the cotton fields. And at the end of the summer, the fish are harvested and put into storage ponds and then sold onwards. So that, that is a large uh, system. This is a cage system that I developed in India. Uh, in India, they have, in Israel, we have 2,000 hectares of reservoirs like the one you saw. Um, we produce about 10, 10 tons of fish per hectare, uh, uh, which is 10,000 kilograms. In India, they have 15 million hectares of reservoirs. They exist. They're, not, they're all used to supply people with water, whether it's potable water or agricultural water. When this is a very small lake, it's 600, uh, 
60 hectares. It's not even, you, if you look on the map of, of lakes in India, it doesn't exist. Um, and we set up a small cave <coughs> facility there, and that produced about 900 tons of pangasius in the first year. And we stocked the lake with ecological fish, which supplied the village and the, the local people with a, a lot of fish. And this water was used to irrigate the rice crops. So it, and they had significant increases in their yields because it was very well fertilized with the fish feed that was being fed. Um, I'm, I'm going to just run through the decoupled system. I think Tom will talk to you more about it because um, he operates a decoupled system. But uh, one of the issues that we will talk about in balanced aquaponic systems is that because you need both disciplines, uh, horticulture and aquaculture, and it's very difficult to balance between the two of them, one of the ways of getting around that has been simply to de decouple it. So go back to hydroponics and growing your plants and go back to having your fish farming going on. Just the water is taken from the fish farm, put into a reservoir, sterilized and used for the hydroponic unit when required. There's no continuous round which it brings in problems of pathogens in both directions, uh, parasites, etc. And um, that's, that's one possibility. Um, this is really the model of the, the, the type of aquaponics that we are uh, striving to go forward to. And when I say we, it's myself, and a team at uh, Ben Gurion University in the Negev, and we work on different aspects. And my uh, aquaponic system in my backyard was the start of this, this project, and since then we've added on two or three aspects which I will, I will go through. Basically, we have a um, the type of aquaponic system that you are all aware, aware of, fish tanks, biological filters, canals, and what I ascertain to do is to balance that system on a continuous basis. In other words, the amount of fish feed going into the system is going to determine how many how, how much growth is going to be on the fish and the plants have to be in sync in their cycle with the amount of nutrients that they have to take out so that the, it balances. And we're talking here about how to get to the balance in this. Um, I just want to run through it and, uh, and, and if anybody has questions on the the, the model, then this is the time to ask. We have basically, I mean, it's a closed cycle, so it doesn't matter where you start, but let's start with water coming into the fish tanks, which has oxygen in it, enough for the fish to eat their food, metabolize and breathe, <coughs> and we are transferring that water to filtration units, biological filtration, which we will talk about, and that water mechanically filtered, in other words, the, the heavy wastes from the fish and the nutrient transfer of ammonia to nitrogen has or already taken place, goes into your plant canals. From your plant canals, it goes to a sump. A sump takes it out to the uh, towers a tower that puts back um, oxygen into the water. The harvesting of the plants and the fish again has to be balanced with the process so that you're putting feed in, you're taking fish out, you're taking plants out, everything, all those factors have to be balanced. 
In addition to that, we have an enormous build-up. One of the problems that I, and I will deal with the problems that the issues that are being dealt with in aquaponics today, in my mind, um, that need to be dealt with, that we are dealing with, one of the biggest problems is that when you are using fish feed, and I won't get into um, whether in the long term we have to be independent on how we produce our own fish feed, but at the moment it's too much to try and even think in that direction. Fish feed commercially produced has been well researched and at this time we need to use that technology and work with it. Uh, but assuming that you have the correct feed for your fish, you will always have waste. And the, 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 the wet waste of the fish that you have is going to be somewhere in the region of at least 50% of the weight of the feed that you put in. And that is going to be a major factor to blocking up the system. Very simple, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking um, anything, uh, anything that is uh, rocket science. It's clear to all of you, the more fish that you produce, the more waste there's going to be in the system. And again, we have this question, at what stage to remove the waste, how to remove the waste, and where is it going to go? So we spent a lot of time thinking, and what we think now is that there's enough fish waste to actually produce the energy to run the aquaponic system. The theoretical side of things, we, we, there are two types of system. One is a raft system, one is the ebb and flow system. This you're all familiar with, I understand. Is there anybody not familiar with these two types of systems? No. So I can just run through that. The ebb and flow system, basically using a media to grow your vegetables on and that water flushes out on a daily, uh, on, a, on a, not a daily, but on a, a timer basis. The uh, water fills up in the bed. When it reaches the top, it releases, goes down. That brings oxygen into the, into the uh, soil. And this system goes round and round. And there are other, other systems on the same basis. But from my point of view as a, as, as a farmer, the, the ebb and flow system has disadvantages in that a lot of your fish waste is going to end up there. And in time it's going to block, and it has to be cleaned out, and it's going to take uh, an enormous amount of energy and effort, and you have to break the system down. So I can't see at this stage, and we've tried this, um, the ebb and flow systems working in a aquaponic system that is going to produce on a large scale. Um, you can it's maybe applicable to a small hobby system, but I don't think that's what we need to do. I think we need to try and find out what are the things that work. It doesn't matter at what level it is, whether it's small or big. Um, this is what they look like. There's a whole lot of structural engineering issues with that. You've got a lot of weight in the air. Um, you've got to have a bigger structure to hold it. You can see there's a metal structure there. Um, I'm going to play you a video. I'm here to introduce Desert Aquaponics, a project put together by myself and Joram Etrog. I, Adrian Barnes, am a fish farmer for 35 years and Yoram is a vegetable grower for 35 years. In the past 20 years, aquaponics has become from a internet dream into reality, though if one does a search on the internet or through communication with companies dealing in aquaponics, it's still very rudimentary. Claims are that aquaponics can save 95% of the water, doesn't require any contact with soil for either production of the fish or the vegetables, and that it is 
capable of being in any place independent of the environmental conditions. So with all of this hype going on, we have decided to test claims that are being made in a practical way. And Desert Aquaponics, the company, was formed in order to do this and thereafter to use the technology and knowledge that came from this process to create modules that can be placed any, anywhere in the world for the production of vegetables and fish. What are we doing in this experiment? Simply we are growing fish in tanks, supplying the vegetables with the water from the uh, fish production and recycling this through filters to the fish once again. We're recording all of the inputs and all of the outputs from this system and we're going to compare the economics with the existing production of fish in intensive systems and the existing production of vegetables that goes on around the world and in Israel is at very high technology levels. This is the fish part of the aquaponic system. It consists of four tanks each with about one cubic meter of water. The tanks are fed by these pipes that come from a degassing filter and from a denitrifying filter which is used to transfer the ammonia of the fish into nitrite and then nitrate that the plants can absorb. Each fish tank has a sump at the bottom below the aeration system that collects the fish feces at the bottom of the tanks and this is emptied on a daily basis to this sump and the concentrated feces are washed out to the plants in the soil garden. Water coming out from the tanks goes into these pipes through a vortex filter that settles any remaining large solids and through a brush filter filtration tank with four compartments that again removes the remaining small solid waste before it goes through the pipe into the canals of the vegetable system. Outlet from the canals of the vegetable system into a sump where there is a series of two pumps, one reserve, and a float that adds water to the system to replace the removed water from the flushing and from the transpiration of the plants. This is the vegetable growing part of the aquaponic system. It consists of canals, floating styrofoam sheets with the plants planted in the styrofoam in cups from the seeding trays. What you see here is the plant system a few days after a sandstorm that we had in the desert and you can see that there's quite a lot of dust on the leaves. The system here consists of two types of plants. A body of plants that is many many different types, includes baby leaves, beans of various types, courgettes, lettuces, leeks and various herbs basil, coriander, parsley, and half of the system composes a set of cucumbers and tomatoes that are used as a comparison to the agricultural farmers using normal greenhouse systems in the desert. The climate is a lot hotter. Here it is cold at night and hot during the day. We, however, seem to be getting reasonable results, and the aim of the experiment is to see whether the yields are comparable in this system to a normally irrigated system. We seem to be using about 10% of the water that is normally used for irrigating the same amount of plants and uh, the water is measured and we will, now, we will know at the end of it our water usage. The fish production is also being monitored and the weight of fish produced over the period will be compared to intensive systems that grow fish without a plant filtration system attached to them. The amount of roots in the canals increases the filtration area of the biological filters and the plants absorb the nitrates, thus releasing the system 
from its nitrogen load. Um, I'm going to go on forward from there. Um, these were the targets of our research. <coughs> How to select efficient plants and compare them to, the similar, to similar systems in monoculture. Is the filtration that we're using fit for purpose? Does it maintain the water quality? How does the water utilization, FCR, food conversion ratio in the fish, and other production uh, compare to conventional? How does production in high desert compare to similar aquaponic systems that are documented in the world? Is the low cost infrastructure, the CAPEX, fit for purpose and reliable? And what period of time can it be relied upon? So, you know, you don't know that until it breaks down, but we've been running with this system for two and a half years. I think it will probably last five years. Um, I'm going to go into the, um, the results of this first cycle. And... Um, Are you, are you able to see these figures? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. So these were the plants that were grown. Cucumbers, tomatoes, lettuce, endives, chard, kale, baby leaves, watercress, uh, borage, basil, and courgettes. Um, courgettes we, we didn't have success with. We simply didn't have success with. They had uh, bad problems with uh, fungal infections, so there was no yield from the, from the uh, courgettes. The borage is a companion plant that we put in there. Um, it helps to reduce the, 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 the pests, and so there's no yield from the borage, but there's a potential yield from borage. It can be eaten. Um, here you have the number of plants that we planted, the linear meter of canal that was given to each of these plants and the yields that we harvested and here we, we measured only the edible yield. Uh, we now understand that and, and, and we're doing a cycle now where we measure also the dry mass of the plant material that can be used which is you know, considered to be waste, you don't have to look at it but it has a meaning in the future and these are the totals um, and the total weight so we had about 435 kilograms between February 13 and July 13. And um, we made a calculation of income um, based on market prices in the area. We, do, we, we use this uh, product, product for ourselves. We barter the, the, the additional with uh, people in our town. Um, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, not a, uh, it, it's not a commercial thing because at the moment aquaponics in Israel is not legal. You cannot grow um, vegetables on water that fish have grown in. It, 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 I don't want to go down all that route. That will change, but it requires, it requires uh, attention. And the figures that are important here are, are the following. Um, it's the, the other thing that we measured, and this is perhaps the most important, was that we, we, we measured the water utilization. In that sump that you saw, there is a stopcock, and when the water le level in the system goes down, it automatically goes in, and we had a water meter on it, so we measured the water going in. And the, 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 the water in the system was as follows, and this is an, an, an important aspect of it. The system fill was about 10.25 cubes. You have to fit, fill the system one time. Um, the washback on a daily basis uh, gave us about 19 cubic meters over the period. The uh, transpiration from the leaves, because besides, this is the wonderful thing and perhaps the biggest gift of aquaponics for use in desert situations, one of the problems in, in horticulture in deserts is that the, um, if you don't irrigate, if something goes wrong with your, 
computerized system or your drip irrigation, your plants die. It doesn't take a day because it's so hot. Here, actually, the plants are in water. They're not going to die. So the, um, the only loss of water that you're getting from the system is the transpiration from the leaves. And that was about 6.4 cubic meters. And it gave us a total of 36.25. And what we did was we compared that figure to the figure in, in, in um, drip irrigation. And drip irrigation is giving you about 70 liters per kilogram of product. And aquaponics is giving you 15.6A, 14.68 in washback, which is actually... A, we considered at that time to be the real loss. We now understand that that can also be put back. But the total loss of aquaponics, including the fill, the initial fill, which you won't have with your second cycle, was about 60. So the 90% saving on water is far out. It's not really a, 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 a good figure. But the challenge is to get down to 14.6H, which is actually your transpiration loss. If we can only lose the water through the leaves and everything else can be recycled, then we can get it down to a quarter, to 75% of the highest technology, which is the drip irrigation. The second factor that we looked at was how many kilograms did we produce per square meter of total production area in the, in the vegetables? And that was about 15 kilograms per square meter. If we look at uh, the, the income, it was about 43 US dollars per square meter. If we compare that to horticulture in um, Holland, for instance, which is the highest technology. Uh, Tom will tell me he's not here, but he'll tell me if it's correct or not. But it's somewhere in the region of 50, 50 euros per, per square meter, the, the best producers. So aquaponics is not far out from all of these things. And to conclude on the, on the pilot investigation. So the production comparison to monoculture indicates positive yields and profitability. Filters maintained water quality. Water use FCR and production parameters positive, reduced environmental impacts indicated. And production in high desert compared to other aquaponic systems uh, was positive, but there are few do documented cases. The infrastructure is fit for purpose, is in use two and a half years. Uh, we estimate the fish tank that, that the, um, the canals would last another two and a half years, so it would be a five year stint with the canals, and the fish tanks, which are fiberglass, would last at least 10 years. Um, at that stage, we did not have. Um, a, uh, we did not have results from the fish, obviously, because um, to run through the build-up system on the fish, when, when we had the system built, we first of all ran water through the system to check the hydraulics, that it's not leaking. We knew that we needed to balance the fish with the filtration, the biofilters, <laughs> and the plants against the weight of fish and the feed that's going in there. So you're stuck in a difficult, you're stuck in a, between a rock and a hard place. What do you put in first? Do you put them in together? How do you make it worth, work? Basically the way we dealt with it, with it was we put um, plants in and fed them with nutrients. While the system was working, by adding nutrients on a daily basis and measuring what was the, um, the EC, the, um, the, the amount of nutrients in there, and then adding on a daily basis until we saw that the 
ammonia had peaked, that the nitrite had peaked, these things that are, you, you, you're clear on, and indicated that the bacterial system was, the bacteria were working in the filters, and then we stopped the introduction of the nutrients and brought in a first batch of fish. I didn't want to bring in the striped bass fish that we grow because they're very sensitive. I brought in koi, as I told you. They're hardy, they were bigger fish, and they started the system running. So we ran these koi and then slowly replaced them with the um, striped bass biomass so that basically um, the introduction of pioneer fish with the koi, we gradually replaced them with the striped bass, and the growth curves of the fish during that cycle compared well to conventional, but we didn't know how much the system was going to take. What we, what we now know is that we reached our pre pre predicted production because it's two years later, and there's one of the striped bass, um, and I'm going to give you your final, I know you're tired from me already, um, the final table. And the final table really is a comparison on the fish farms between where we started today, which is um, a pond system producing um, striped bass in the United States, uh, a RAS system the most advanced, high-technical uh, fish system, and our little uh, aquaponic pilot. And it's very difficult to make a comparison between those big things and, and a very small pilot farm, and there's all questions of scale-up and issues, but basically normalized all the figures and did the economics on it. And I won't go through it all right now, Obviously, in the two fish farms, you don't have vegetable production. So you're going to have the additional vegetable production if you're doing the aquaponic system. But, uh, and, and the economics would show that the um, aquaponic system would be a lot more profitable. However, the, the points that, that are really important here is that if you look at the area required to produce and I've, everything is normalized on 550 tons of fish and the vegetables that came out in ratio to what it was, which was about one to one in our system. Because in the two and a half years, we're now producing somewhere in the region of 600 kilograms of fish from the four cubic meters in a year and about 600 kilograms of vegetables. So it, that system was based on, that analysis was based on that. The ratio in terms of land, if you need one hectare of aquaponics, in a RAS system you need three and a half hectares, and in a standard pond system you need 20 hectares. And the water utilization is more extreme, you need one unit in the aquaponic against five times as much in a re recycled aquaculture system, and 124 times in a pond system. So all the indications are that aquaponics has a lot of potential. Tomorrow morning uh, I will talk about what I see as the major issues to growing this for further forward. So um, I'm going to close now and if you want to ask questions I'm happy to receive them if you still have strength. Brilliant. Uh, congratulations for your very quite interesting uh presentation. Uh, can, can you explain me your, what, what was the, the, the fish density you, you were talking about koi, mm. koi in, mm. in the example that you showed us. What was the, you said four cubic meter fish, uh, water, sorry, yes. four cubic meters. Yes. And yes. what was the, the density of fish, I mean the, 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 the product, fish production? Well, initially, initially the first stocking, once we had the filters working, I brought in 1,200 uh, culled koi, the koi that the, the grower would normally, he would uh, destroy them, you know, or, or, because they're not, they're not for marketing. Yeah, and um, they were about 5 grams in size, so it, uh, you can make the calculation, and 
then they went into the four tanks and then when I brought in the striped bass, they went into three tanks, excuse me. And when I brought in the striped bass fingerlings, which were one gram, they went into the fourth tank. And then as the koi grew, they were removed and the, the bass were split into two tanks first and then into three tanks and then into four tanks. But that was towards the end of this cycle was when the, we, we got the koi out and the, the bass were in the system. Yeah. Now we maintain a biomass somewhere between 50 and 70 kilograms per cubic meter. In the, when I say 50 to 70, it's 50 to 70 if you take into consideration just the 4 cubic meters, which is incorrect, because you need to take into consideration the 10.25 cubic meters, because it's all water and it's all in the system. Yeah? And it's a completely closed water system? Completely closed, except for the washback. And the, the washback from the filters, now we are starting to close that in by trying to put it through a USAB filter, a, uh, an anaerobic digester basically, so that the uh, nutrients that are in the fish waste, more of them can be recycled into the system and you only end up taking sludge out of the system, which is zero water exchange. Transfer from there to there is going to take some time, but that's what we're working on. Sure, go ahead. Just say your uh, Rob. <laughs> Rob. <laughs> Rob's um, name, I know. <laughs> no worries. Um, I was wondering if you could explain a bit more about this, this ratio between yeah. intensive fish farm and aquaponic system. Sure. Because I, I, I didn't get it. Uh, which part did you get? Um, from as I read the figures now, you mm. say that the fish production in aquaponic system is the the ratio is fish production per area that you use, right? No. What I did was I, I took the, the North Carolina farm produces 550 tons a year. I'll give you the two references for these articles. Yeah. Sure. But the North Carolina farm produces 550 tons. I can't remember what the Auburn RAS system produced, but I normalized all the figures that they had to 550 tons. I then took the aquaponic system on the figures that I got out and multiplied it up to 550 okay, tons. It's an extrapolation. Yeah, it's an extrapolation. Okay. Yeah. Um, but, and the ratio that's highlighted in green, what is, what is the ratio? The ratio is the area required to make that 550 ton production. Okay. Okay? So you would need, uh, you've got the areas here, the actual areas. This is 410 hectares mm -hmm. for the Carolina Pond Farm. The RAS farm was 70 hectares. And the aquaponic farm that produces 550 tons would be 20 hectares. Okay? So is the, the fish production in aquaponics is that much more intensive than, than a normal Recirculation facility? You, t you asked me. You yeah, explained to me. I don't, I don't think so. Uh, so that's why I was... All, yeah, that's what confuses you. You're saying, an, I'm saying an RAS system is about three times less efficient than, a, than an aquaponic system. But I, but I have to prove that. In, in, you know, it, it, that's what it, it worked in, the, in a four cubic meter and, ten, and 30 meters of aquaponic canals. I'm not telling you that it's going to work at uh, 20 hectares. Yeah, yeah. There's enormous issues with scale, <coughs> which, which I've had. There's a big difference in, 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 in what region you are or what, what production system you use, so obviously there's a big variation. No, there's a, because of the <laughs> geographical difference, that's also... But I, I, can't, I can't see how... You know, the fish are in water, basically. They, don't, they, they know what the water temperature is, the, a little bit of barometric pressure is going to, you know, but that's what they know. They don't know, they know water and water quality, yeah? What I can tell you at a fish farmer's experience level is that if, I, I'd never worked with striped bass before. I, I've never worked with striped bass 
massive on a day-to-day -day basis over years. I'd never grown striped bass. Striped bass was good for two reasons. First of all, there's good hatchery in, in Israel. And out of all the fish that are available, it was the correct fish that met this extreme temperatures, you know. So th that was really what I chose uh, as a result of the temperature range. But everybody said, and there's a guy that produced striped bass in California, in uh, Watsonville, and he you know, was one of these big aquaponic systems that was going to happen. And he was saying the striped bass are very sensitive fish, they're not going to, you're going to get bad reactions every time you go into feed, they go into, into a fit and so on and so forth. I didn't find any of this, not only that, um, basically there was no mortalities throughout the cycle. No. We had a, really nothing. I mean, what we put in came out, we had an, an oxygen problem. And we had a, lot, a mortality, a small mortality in the middle of the second year. But besides that, we, we didn't have an ongoing, you know, in normal fish farming practice, you, 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 you accept about a 10% mortality over a period of uh, a cycle. It's, it's going to be normal. You're not going to see where those fish disappeared. We don't have mortalities in this system. So, from a point of view of the behavioral health of the fish, they were very good throughout this. Now, whether that is to do with the fact that, you're, you're asking me why, that's what you're saying. How can you explain that you're getting three times the yield of an RAS system that was probably the best RAS, the most expensively built RAS system that I know, um, <laughs> And uh, I'm saying there must be something to do with the fact that you have a lot of roots of plants. Yeah. And they're alive. One of the problems of fish filtration is always that when you're working with uh, um, biological filters that are not moving, which is why you get into the... And you're going to talk about these things, so hopefully, um, is that you, you, it's not animate, but, but because the roots are alive, perhaps they are affecting the system um, and doing filtration that all of our mechanical filters, non-biological filters, can't do. So I don't have an explanation, I don't have an answer. Um, we, we will get to the, these answers in time. I also cannot tell you these are these figures have been validated in three replications, and they are. Um, I, I can stand a hundred percent. This is what I put down. You know, I, tomorrow when I go through my talk, I'll show you how to keep the records. Today, there are a lot of surprises. There are a lot of surprises, and I think we're all going to. Every, everybody that works with aquaponics is going to find surprises as they do. <laughs> We're done, yeah? <laughs> I think uh, so. Are there any other questions? Just, just the last one. Yeah. Sure. Uh, about uh, the biologic media you, you, you use, I mean, in the, in the, bio, in the bio filter. Yeah. In biologic filtration, excuse me, uh, which kind of media, which kind of support, battery or support you use? I, I didn't, I didn't show. I just realized I didn't show. There's a there's a fourth filter that we have on the way back from the vegetables, which is a bead filter. I'm sure you're familiar with bead filters. It's our own own yeah bead filter. It's our own manufacture. We manufacture our own. Moving? Is it moving or moving? Stat it's static, and then the washback is moving. It, Bead filter it goes up yeah. through the media, and then once a day, once every three days, it's a question of feeling, feeling how blocked it is. You, you wash it back. So, and the other filters are simply brush filters. Okay. Yeah, that, you know the vortex and the brush filter. <clears throat> One of the things that I can say is that the uh, filtration in our system is heavy. 
You know, it's like if you've got uh, the total system is 10.25 cubic meters, then you've got at least two and a half cubic meters in the filters. So if you then expand that onto a very big scale farm, it's, uh, it's going to be questionable how good it is. But I wanted to go for maximum filtration and then work down. Not go for too little filtration and get problems with the fish, get problems with the plants and then work up.